The next speaker is Christopher Matthews. Chris is a historical archaeologist and professor of archaeology at Montclair State University. His research examines the archaeology of capitalism, race and racism, and cultural heritage in the United States. He has extensive experience working with community-based organizations to enhance and interpret historical and material culture resources. Chris holds a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University and has been a faculty member at Hofstra and Harvard Universities. He serves as co-director of the project A Long Time Coming in Setauket, New York, and the Reverse Archaeology of Interstate 280 project in Orange, New Jersey. His publications include several books, such as An Archaeology of History and Tradition, The Archaeology of American Capitalism, Ethnographic Archaeologies, and The Archaeology of Race in the Northeast, co-edited with Allison McGovern. So Chris, please come up. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, a real honor. Um, I'm going to talk today about a project I've been working on for the last 10 years in Setauket, New York, out on Long Island. Uh, we're going to talk about one particular site uh, that fits the theme of this conference pretty well. Uh, but um, I just want to recognize that this is an ongoing project related with a community-based organization called Higher Ground Intercultural and Heritage Association. Uh, who is in the process of struggling to preserve a historic district related to the descendant African and Native American community in Setauket. And so the work we're doing is trying to elevate awareness and understanding of their struggle. Um, okay. How do I move it? Oh, this one here. It's just upside down. <laughs> um, this mundane document is, in fact, one of the most important records from the early history of the community of color in Setauket, New York. It's a deed to a property in what is now Oldfield, a small village adjacent to and formerly part of Setauket on the north shore of Long Island. The parcel, is a ha a par the parcel, a half acre lot on the west shore of Conscience Bay, was sold by Silas Tobias to Abraham Tobias for $30 in 1823. We know from other sources that Silas and Abraham Tobias were people of color, and as likely they were related, either brothers or, I think, father and son. This document also establishes the historic ownership by the Tobias family of a plot of land that contains one of the most significant archaeological sites in the Setauket area. These remains are what is left of the home that these two, two Tobiases and their descendants built and lived in for most of the 19th century. The deed is also possibly the earliest record in the Setauket area, identifying people of color as property owners. In this paper, I discuss the findings from the archaeology we've done at the Silas Tobias site and set them in a context that helps to understand some of the racial dynamics at work in early 19th century Long Island. The time frame from this paper is roughly 1800 to 1848. The former date marks the approximate year that Silas Tobias first lived at the site, and the latter date is the year the first African Methodist Episcopal Church was founded in Setauket. As three of the founding trustees of the AME Church were members of the Tobias family, the church was certainly an important part of their lives. Yet the church may have been about more than just establishing a place of worship. Like most other public acts by people of color, Establishing the AME Church also relates to how Setauket's colored community sought to control how they would be understood by outsiders as well as themselves in the region. This proposal is based in part on how the politics of race changed in, the, in New York between 1800 and 1848. At the turn of the century, the non-white community in the town of Brookhaven, which includes Setauket, was split between those who were enslaved, 224, and those who were free, 230. The Silas Tobias was the head of a free household of color, one of only 26 such households at the time. New York's Gradual Emancipation Act of 1799 forecasted the end of slavery in the state in 1827, and during this emancipation era, the number of enslaved persons declined, though many still lived in white households. By 1850, independent households of color ac accounted for almost 75% of all the people of color in the township, suggesting a community that was growing, more robust, and perhaps providing the, re the reason for establishing an AME church in 1848. This complicated emancipation era history, which combines slavery and freedom and dependent and independent living, has rightly been understood as a time of flux. 
a New York, as New York society moved away from slavery, basic idea, uh, excuse me, basic aspects of identity, status, social roles, and relations came into question. Several scholars have looked at this era, often seeing in, in it the precursors of one of the most prominent way of, of one prominent way that the social instability of the northern of northern emancipation was resolved, which is the hardened racism epitomized by a derogatory blackface minstrelsy. Yet some new works propose that the emancipation era had a certain logic of its own. Christopher Smith, whose book is depicted here, suggests it was a time of Creole synthesis, that's the title of my paper, and that, that in the multi-ethnic world of New York City, as well as many other northern ports, work camps, canal stops, as well as rural and frontier towns, the groups who had formerly been defined by separate legal statuses began to mix under new conditions. In so doing, they found in each other's culture and traditions, especially their artistic and ritual performances, ways to understand and develop something new. The Creole synthesis thus articulated a progressive political critique of, a th of tired dominant traditions that could no longer hold up in these complex spaces, where an emerging multiracial democracy that some envisioned as the future of the United States was the daily scene. For Smith, this outlook is evident in, in diverse expressions, including in the inter integration of black and white artistic traditions found in new works developed for the New York stage, as well as in the ways to talk its most famous local artist depicted people of color in his paintings. This artist is William Sidney Mount who was born in Setauket and is regarded as one of America's most accomplished genre painters. He was successful during his lifetime and for many his work was appealing because of its honest rep representation of rural life in America. This was especially true in his earlier work, which depicted scenes drawn from his life in and around Setauket and thus provides useful information for understanding the archeology span there. He found recognition early in his career for this painting, Rustic Dance After a Sleigh Ride. Here you can see a complicated scene focused on a dancing couple at the center, but the painting also includes three black men, a musician, a bellows man, and the sleigh driver. Smith and others point out, A, the fact that these figures are included in the painting suggests that men like them would have been typically present at such gatherings. That the, B, that these men are happy participants, enjoying the scene as much as any of the others, and C, that they each play an essential role in the action of the painting. There would be no sleigh, drive without the, sleigh ride without the driver, no heat or light without the bellows man, and no dancing without the musician. The key point here is that these roles are not only typical, they are also controlling. Mount, in fact, described Anthony Clapp, a black fiddle player who was also a servant to the Mount family and who taught William how to play the violin like this. He was a master in this way and acted well his part. It is this sort of upside down assessment of, the slave, of a slave or a servant as master that characterizes the Creole synthesis. So what does an archeology span of a Creole synthesis look like? My hypothesis is that we should be able to document the capacity of people of color to maintain control over key aspects of their lives despite their difference from the majority and that they, would, and that they did so in ways that made their independence evident to the larger community, i.e. it was a public statement. Thus Clapp, the fiddle player, while a servant to the Mount family, nevertheless had some authority as an accomplished musician in the taverns like the one depicted in the painting. In fact, the fiddle player in Rustic Dance is likely based on Clapp, and the whole scene is thought to represent the tavern run by Mount's maternal grandfather, Jonah Hawkins. Point being that the success of the family's tavern may have, may have rested in part on Clapp's musical skill. An acknowledgement of this is evident in this headstone that formerly stood in the Mount family cemetery, on which was inscribed a flowing tribute written by Mount's uncle and mentor, Micah Hawkins, as well as a violin carved in high relief an especially unusual and expensive treatment for the grave marker of a former slave. <clears throat> okay, while it's hard to excavate the musical talent support that supported Clapp's limited autonomy, the Tobias site that we did, the excavations of the Tobias site allow us to see something similar in the way this household maintained and expressed their cultural and economic autonomy in the emancipation era. I wanna look again at the deed that I started with, which mentions a dwelling house and a lot of land situated on the west side of Conscience Bay in the town aforesaid, containing in by estimation half an acre as the fence now stands. A house, property, and a fence that established the Silas Tobias, excuse me, that established Silas Tobias owned and occupied a home that anyone could see. Moreover, he, that he sold the parcel with the house already standing on an improved lot means the home was built before this deed was executed, and since there is no previous deed that we know of, Tyler, Tobias likely lived on a lot without one. How he acquired the property, we don't know, but his presence there was certainly understood. 
His presence is also documented in the 1800 federal census, where he appears listed as Silas a Negro, alongside several other free households of color, as you can see here. With this information, I believe that a small house depicted on the 1797 Isaac Hulse map is the Silas Tobias home. It's located in the same spot along Conscience Bay between Oldfield Road and the shoreline where the archaeological deposits were located, as well as where the house is shown and identified on later maps, as you can see here and then here. The early date is also supported by the archaeology. Ceramics from the site include painted pearlware teacups and printed pearlware flatwares with TPQs in the late 18th century, uh, which we also observed in the, in the field that the early ceramic types such as creamware were found only in the lower levels of the principal deposits. This data suggests, therefore, that the Tobias home was occupied prior to or around 1800, making the site the earliest identified household, independent household in Setauket headed by a person of color, yet another feature that would have made these people visible to others. Archaeology has provided additional information about the Tobias home in daily life. The site was initially surveyed in 2015 using a 10 meter offset shovel test, crit, uh, shovel test pit grid and the historic materials were found to concentrate in one area of the site. They then excavated uh, 11 one by one meter test units in the area where these artifacts were concentrated. In all, 15,000 plus artifacts, not including the shells, weighing 34,000 plus grams, uh, were collected for analysis. So a lot more than yours, Mike. <laughs> Uh, the site can be divided into three sections. On the west side of the excavated area closest to the road, the test units exposed deposits directly associated with the house, and this included a dense concentration of stone and brick that represented the foundation in a fallen chimney stack. The section, this section of the site also included a deep deposit with the larger artifacts interpreted to represent either a subfloor pit or the ground surface formerly under an upraised house. Um, Excuse me. The second area of the site is associated with the back of the house in the, in the center of the excavated area, where, and here we uncovered a series of small concentrations of stone and brick, which were the remains of pier supports that supported the house off the ground, at least in this section. Uh, a transition from lighter to darker soil at this point also suggests the western section was, project, was protected from exposure. Um, the third section of the site is on the east side of the excavated area closest to the shore. Here, the principal deposit consists of a very dark soil layer filled with an abundance of shells, other food remains, and artifacts of all types. This is clearly a backyard trash midden used by the family for routine household refuse disposal over the course of the 19th century. No architectural or other features were identified in this area suggesting the deposit is essentially undisturbed. In sum, the site is well organized and preserved and easily understood in terms of where the house stood and how the family used the space around it. The majority of artifacts recovered were in the excavations are from the household structural category. Second in quantity were artifacts related to food procurement, preparation, service, storage, and actual food remains. The remaining artifacts belonging to clothing, labor, and personal categories. The distribution is generally consistent with other household sites, especially where the former structures are no longer standing. And in this way, the household is a fairly typical small 19th century home. Distinctions appear, however, when we look more at some artifacts more closely. First thing to stand out is the large number of shells in the backyard midden. While not as dense as pre-contact shell middens on Long Island, the midden deposit, especially in the sections furthest from the house, was unusually dense with shells for a historic site. Even acknowledging the fact that the site is located on the shore, the density of shells is not typ typical of other historic sites in the region, especially sites dating to the 19th century. The vast majority are, of shells are softshell clam, a local species found in sandy or muddy bottoms of bays and estuaries like Conscience Bay, and most of the other shellfish species are also common in estuary waters. The, the, shells, oh, excuse me, the shells thus indicate the bay was a food source for the Tobias family, and, and the consistency of species in every level within the midden suggests they, they exploited their own shoreline over the generations they lived at the site. Complementing the shells, the faunal collection is quite diverse, consisting of specimens of mammal, turtle, birds, and fish, domestic mammals represented by cattle, sheep, and pig. There is no evidence of any standardized butchery traces, such as saw marks, and there is quite a bit of the non-meaty parts of the animals, such as phalanges, skull, and mandible fragments in the collection. And these features indicate that Tobias family raised and butchered animals themselves, a fact that may also explain the fence mentioned in the deed. 
There are also bones from snapping turtle and smaller mammals, including rabbit and possum, that reflect trapping or hunting done to supplement the diet. Bird species are both domestic and wild and include chicken, goose, and several bones of duck. The, the collection also includes the largest, a large number of fish vertebrae, which along with water birds and shells, show that the use of the nearby shoreline for, wild food, wild, for collecting wild food sources. Botanical remains show that Tobias made use of wild plants with edible household and medicinal uses. Species included amaranth, which is a leaf vegetable used as a dye and, a medicinal ornament, and for medicinal and ornamental purposes. Gallium, which could be used for bedding material, as well as a potherd, a coffee, coffee substitute, a medicine and dye, and huckleberry and cherry, which are both wild edible fruits, and sumac, which is used as tea, tie, dye, tea jelly, dye, or medicine. Perhaps the most fascinating part of the assemblage, though, are 440 lithic tools and debitage fragments recovered in the midden. In an extensive analysis, Mark Tweedy, an expert on Long Island's lithic uh, material culture, concludes that these artifacts are likely contemporaneous with the historic Tobias household. In other words, they're not holdovers from a previous occupation, as far as we can tell, uh, and that they represent the use of lithic, lithic technology in the 19th century. The artifacts are overwhelmingly quartz, a readily available local stone, uh, and the majority were also produced using central pedal or freehand reduction that was also the most common technique to produce lithic tools in the pre-contact period on Long Island. The collection also includes an ample evidence of primary debitage, retouching scars, as well as tertiary flakes, indicating that the tools were likely made and maintained on the site. Analysis suggests a wide range of possible functions, including as projectiles, knives, and a wide spectrum of generalized scraping, cutting, and engraving tools. The lithic artifacts thus indicate the use of freely available materials, along with the traditional local technology mirroring the evidence of the shoreline food exploitation. One last set of artifacts rounds out this discussion, and these are the remains of two eel spearheads recovered from the units adjacent to the house. Eel spears are long-handled wooden shafts with wrought iron heads used to capture and hold slippery eels by pinching their thick skin. The style of eel spears at the Tobias house would have had a central spoon that is missing from the recovered examples. As the eels live in Conscience Bay and in other local waters, eel spearing demonstrates yet one more example of the way the Tobiases exploited the immediate local environment for food resources. Yet eel spearing also has a deep resonance in the region because of what many consider William Sidney Mount's masterpiece, Eel Spearing at Setauket, a painting that depicts a prominent woman of color standing in the front of a small skiff, ready to plunge an eel spear into the water. The, eel, the spearhead in the painting, if you look up close, is almost exactly the same type as the ones recovered at the Tobias site. Historic documents indicate that the setting of the painting is Conscience Bay, looking east across the water towards Strong Neck, a familiar place for those of us who've worked at the site. This vantage point would have been a very, very close to the Tobias property. It is quite possible that Mount knew that Tobias family, and off, as he often employed local people as models, thus there is an argument to be made that the woman in the painting and the eel spear she is holding were both from the Tobias household. In fact, one could argue that the, uh, the eel spear on the far right is the eel spear in the painting. <laughs> the evidence from the uh, Tobias site tells a fairly straightforward story of their, locally use, uh, their, lo their use of locally available natural resources to support their livelihood. More so, the evidence strongly suggests that they knew and used traditional Native American cultural knowledge to do so, including both lith lithic technology as well as the likelihood that they chose to live where they did because of the access to essential shoreline resources long used by Native, Amer Native Long Islanders. While there is no independent documentation that the Tobiases were native people themselves, they seem to have lived in many ways indigenous lives. To conclude, I want to circle back to the idea of the Creole synthesis. What does it mean that the, the Tobias family lived in many ways like Native Americans in the 19th century? One perspective is that the rep they represent the survival of indigenous people and culture despite colonization and displacement, but I, I don't think this tells the whole story. Rather, I think that what we see here is less the preservation of Native culture than the creolization of American life. Certainly, this data is evidence that they followed a visibly alternative way of life in Setauket, fishing, eel spearing, trapping, hunting, shellfish gathering, and especially collecting and making stone tools would have been noticed and understood by observers as out of the ordinary in the 19th century. These practices could have set up the Tobiases for ridicule, but it didn't. The authentic and carefully crafted image of the eel spear here, portrayed by Mount, a woman who dominates a scene and towers over the other character, a white boy, falls in line with an understanding that the daily life at, at the Tobias household was organized, successful, and framed in large part by their autonomy. 
This may, exact, may be exactly what Mount was trying to express in his painting. Arguably, it is also what the community of color was saying to their white neighbors when they pronounced three Tobias men as the founding trustees of their new church. In this case, though, it was not their Native American or their African ancestry that mattered. It was their capacity to successfully lead a household of color in the context of an increasingly difficult, difficult racialized culture. That's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you.